Well, I'm Dr. Christopher Schumpf. I'm here today to speak to you about uh, nutrient -rich lifestyle recommendations for healthy eyes. And, and uh, today we're going to learn about several things uh, that are important for your eyes and learn how to maintain healthy eyes and sharp vision the natural way. Oh. We'll uh, also, hopefully by the end of the lecture, understand the proper diet to take and to eat uh, for healthy eyes and what nutritional supplements to take. Um, and the final thing we'll probably touch upon a little bit is on learning ways to protect your eyes from environmental factors, uh, such as UV light. And uh, something that you may not be aware of is blue light, which can be damaging to your eyes. So we'll talk about that. Oh, the other thing I wanted to say, this, this makes it informal. If you have questions during the lecture, just raise your hand and uh, hopefully I'll be able to answer them. And uh, we'll make it interactive. Maybe I'll have a question for you guys. So pay attention. You may fall in sleep. So let's take it back to high school biology first. I think it'd be good to go through um, understanding the eye, the anatomy of the eye, before we proceed further. But um, the eye is made of over 2 million operational parts. So it's a very complex organ. It's the second most complex organ behind the brain. Um, over 36,000 million bytes of information is processed by your eye in a matter of an hour. So very important, and a lot of us take it for granted. We wake up in the morning, we can see, but uh, until something goes wrong, you realize how important vision is to you. And to tell you the truth, out of all the senses, probably vision is the most important to me, and if I had to lose all the other senses and have just vision, that would probably be the one I'd want to have to lose last. But um, we won't go over all the two million parts of the eyes, but uh, we'll go over, I wonder if we have a pointer on here. But uh, we'll go over some of the main structures that we're going to talk about that are going to be important for some of the diseases we'll talk about. Um, the first one being the cornea, which is the front domed portion of the eye. That's depicted here. And that's a clear membrane. There's, it's avascular, meaning that it, there's no uh, blood vessels in there. And that's important because if there was blood vessels, light could not pass through that cornea and uh, get to the retina. So that uh, is very important. The other thing that's going to be important for today's lecture is the lens. And that's, um, that's okay. That's a crystalline, a hard lens material. And uh, that provides the focusing of the eye. And then also there's a thin little membrane that coats the inner wall of the eye, and that's called the retina. And then there's a very specific part called the fovea, which is located a little off from the optic nerve. And that's, uh, the fovea is the center of your macula, and I'm sure you've heard of macular degeneration. But the fovea provides you with your ability, if you're looking at something, you're fixating on something, that's the part of the retina that you're using. So it's made up of many cones um, and a, a very critical part to seeing. So when you hear of macular degeneration, uh, that's the part of the, the eye that's affected. So those are the three main parts of the, the main diseases we'll talk about today, but again, Think of your eye as like a camera. You know, light passes through. It's focused by the cornea and the lens. It has to focus right onto the retina. If it doesn't, if it focuses behind or in front of it, you're going to get a blurry image. So typically, if you see somebody wearing glasses or contacts, the purpose of the glasses in front or the contacts on the cornea are to provide that light focus right on the, the retina so you can see it clearly. Um, pretty much it on um, the anatomy of the eye. Hopefully that refreshes you from high school. So the three main conditions we're going to talk about uh, today are dry eye syndrome, cataracts, and macular degeneration. The reason we're talking about just solely these three, these are things, these conditions are the conditions where you can actually do things to um, protect your eyes and improve your eyes. So lifestyle changes, nutritional supplements that you can take, these are the three basic um, major eye diseases that you can help try to prevent. Um, there's also one other one not listed here, and the reason glaucoma is not listed is because it's, it's a genetic condition. There's, there's nothing you can take, no supplement, nothing you can do to try to prevent that, being that it's genetic. Uh, so we'll start with dry eye, we'll get into cataracts and 
the one we'll probably spend most of the time on is, is macular degeneration. So dry eye syndrome. Uh, dry eye is a condition in which there is not insufficient tears to lubricate and nourish the front surface of the eye, and the uh, tears are laid along the cornea, as we talked about earlier. Um, people with dry eyes either do not produce enough tears or they have uh, poor tear film quality. So either of those two ways you can develop dry eye. Uh, it's a common condition and it's often a chronic problem, meaning that it's not curable. It's not like pink eye. Uh, pink eye, you're given antibiotic drops and uh, you're treated and you typically don't have a problem from it. With dry eyes, it's a, a problem that pretty much stays with you the rest of your life. The mechanism of dry eye, um, it's either due to an insufficient amount of tear production or poor quality of tears. So if there's three layers to your tear film, there's the outer oily layer, the middle aque uh, aqueous or watery layer, and the inner mucous layer. So typically with an adequate amount of tear production, your lacrimal gland, gland which is typically right in the uh, upper outer corner underneath your lid. If that does not produce enough tears, then you're going to have inadequate production of tears, which will ultimately lead to dry eye symptoms such as burning, sandy, gritty kind of feelings in your eyes. The other way to have dry eyes is to produce enough tears, but have an ability to keep the oily layer on the top from preventing the aqueous layer or the watery layer from evaporating. So that's what's called evaporative dry eye. Um, the oily layer is produced by what are called meibomian glands. There's 15 on the top and 10 on the bottom, and they'll produce that oily layer, and it keeps that aqueous layer from evaporating. Uh, so if there's either what's called blepharitis or meibomianitis, where there's those clogging to those ducts, then you're not going to produce that oily layer, and your eyes will ultimately be dry again because of the evaporation of the watery layer. So two ways to have dry eyes. Causes of dry eyes, um, just age. Uh, out of all the three conditions we're going to talk about, the older we live, the more uh, likelihood we're going to develop these conditions. So just in a natural aging process, our lacrimal gland that produces the tears will um, decrease its production just as we get older. Um, gender is another factor. Uh, it's definitely more common with women. Women who are on birth control pills, um, that does diminish the, the tear production. Uh, women in menopause, and uh, that's another thing that we tend to see uh, dry eyes with. Use of medications, uh, antihistamines, um, high blood pressure medications, antidepressants, those are the three main ones that can cause that gland to not produce enough tears. Uh, there's medical conditions that are associated with dry eyes too, arthritis being the big one, diabetes is also another one. Um, there's a, a syndrome called Sjogren's syndrome. It involves having arthritis, dry eye, and dry mouth, and you typically have a very severe dry eye in those conditions. So um, there is associations with systemic medical conditions that can be associated with dry eye. Um, environmental factors, if you're continually looking at a computer all day at work, your tear reflex decreases, your eyes are actually going to dry. You need that blink reflex to keep a nice tear film on the surface of your eye. Um, the environment you live in. Uh, you live out in the desert, out in Phoenix, that kind of thing. It's definitely going to play a role in terms of how, how dry or, or how wet your eyes are. And also contact lens wear. Wearers typically will have dryness too uh, at some point during their contact wear. The other factor is if you hear of refractive surgery, LASIK procedure. Patients who have had that are definitely more susceptible to having issues with dry eye. So those are some of the causes. Basic treatment uh, for the uh, minimal to mild cases, we would supplement tears. Uh, again, if we're not producing enough tears, then you can get more tears in the eyes. And there's three basic uh, products that you can see that are over the counter. There's the artificial tears, which are the thinner 
uh, artificial tears you see uh, in the drugstores, grocery stores. They can have preservatives. They can have preservative. They can be preservative free. And typically, we like patients to be on the preservative free form. The reason being, as we said, this is dry eye syndrome is a chronic condition. So it's going to be with your lifetime. You're going to need to keep using those drops. And if you need to keep using those drops, you don't want to instill preservatives in your eyes for that period of time. So preservative free is what's recommended on those. Go ahead. Methylcellulose is one. Is there a product you mean that's just natural without a preserver? They all don't. Um, you can actually find what's called Refresh or Sustain or some of the products. You can get them with preservatives. They come in a multi-dosing bottle. Or you'll get the, the best way to know if they're preservative-free, they'll come in little vials, the single-use vials. Those are preservative free. So that's the best way to know. And you'll sometimes see either sensitive or preservative free written right on the box. Okay? Um, the second type of uh, supplement of artificial tears is a gel form. It's a little thicker, it's in between, a little bit more viscous than the artificial tear. We use those in cases for moderate uh, or sometimes severe cases of dry eyes. And they, they stay longer in the eye because they're thicker. Uh, and the final. Um, way to treat dry eyes with artificial tears is an ointment um, that's typically administered at bedtime and, and it's typically used for really severe dry eyes. The reason it's given at bedtime is because um, it can really blur the vision. It's thick. It's thick, almost as thick as toothpaste. So we talked about ways to supplement tears. There's also a way to help with dry eyes by blocking the outflow of tears from eyes. So every time you blink, the tears are pushed towards your nose. And in the inner corners, you can see here, there's a little opening. It's called the punctus. There's a little opening where the tears are drained through. There's one on the lower and the upper lid. And we can, just like a sink, we can block the amount of tears that leave your eye by putting a stopper or a plug in there. And um, there's a couple of different kinds of punctal plugs. But it's so small, you can see it's on a matchstick here. It's about the size of 0.3 millimeters in size. So it's, it's very small, and it's made of, of silicone, typically. There's permanent ones, ones that stay in there. Um, sometimes they can fall out. But uh, they also have dissolvable ones that we use for more of the mild dry eye cases where it, it just dissolves after three months or six months. So um, that's another way that we can help with, with dry eye syndromes. And Final thing is, in the severe cases, sometimes we do cautery. We can cauterize the, uh, the punctus so the tears don't drain from the eye. Now, remember, there's two of them, so we'll typically only block the bottom one, so there's still ability for tears to flow out of the eyes. Otherwise, it will come down the side of your face. Unless you had really severe dry, dry eyes, and sometimes we'll block both of them. Question? So back in terms of doing this procedure, you, there are different formulations of artificial tears, some that are helpful for the oily layer. Uh, one in mind that comes to mind is sustained balance. Uh, so there are different formulations. And basically, the doctor recommendation would let you know exactly which one would be best to use. Salazian is. Basically, the, we went, talked about the meibomian glands. Those, those are those glands that produce the oil layers. Those can get clogged up, and that's what causes the styre salazian. It blocks up. Everything gets stuck in there. So, yes, yeah, they are related. Um, I think that's pretty much it on the punctal plugs. Any questions on that? Dry eyes? Oh, for sure. Definitely. Yeah, consciously trying, yeah, consciously trying to make yourself blink is one way. But the, we have what's called the 20-20 rule. Every 20 um, minutes to take a 20-second break, looking away from the screen, and, and that's usually what we recommend to help with that. 
So we talked about um, supplementing, we talked about blocking outflow of tears. Um, also there's ways of increasing tear production. We talked about the lacrimal gland, the gland that produces the tears. There is a prescription um, eye drop that can be prescribed uh, called the Restasis, and you may have seen commercials of um, an ophthalmologist uh, who says she's also a patient. But uh, Restasis has been known to uh, increase the uh, lacrimal glands produced tears. And again, we use those in cases of mo moderate to severe um, insufficient dry eye. Um, the other thing with the restasis is it's not like an artificial tear. An artificial tear, you'll get the immediate impact of putting that in your eye with restasis, and sometimes patients will say, I, I tried the drop, you know, it didn't help me at all. But the reason it doesn't help, it, it has to be used for a sustained period of time, six months to up to uh, a year before you get the maximal effect of that. So it takes a while for that restasis to really kick in and help. And then on to our things that we really wanted to talk about is uh, nutritional supplements. So taking omega-3 fatty acids, either be it through fish oil or fish oil, uh, flax, flax seed oil are ways to help stimulate tear production. And then other factors you can do, um, hydration, drinking water, you know, eight glasses of water a day is usually recommended. Uh, if your, your bedroom is, is really dry, humi using a humidifier is important too. And then we talked about blinking more frequently, especially when you're on a computer. Okay. And on the uh, omega-3 fatty acids, we'll get into more detail of that next. So how can you get your omega-3 fatty acids? And we talked about flaxseed oil and the fish oil. And flax seed oil and flax seeds, either way, uh, is high in alpha linolenic uh, acid, which is ultimately converted to the omega-3 fatty acids, it's EPA, DHA. Uh, I won't give you the, the real, what those stand for. But those are the primary omega-3 fatty acids that are helpful for dry eyes. You can um, get your flax seed either through capsule form, liquid, or as I said, um, through an actual whole seed form. Um, some patients will take that whole seed and grind it down and, and put it on shallots is one way they, they reuse it. The um, Mayo Clinic recommends for dry eye and eye health is about one to two grams of flaxseed oil capsules by mouth for up to uh, 180 days. Or you can take it, as I said, as a, a liquid and it's one to two tablespoons is what the Mayo Clinic recommends for that. The liquid form is the most commonly commonly used, uh, and it must be cold pressed and refrigerated, or else it's going to lose its ability to, to convert into the uh, EPA and the EDHA. And that conversion occurs during digestion. So you're actually, by taking flaxseed oil, you're not taking omega-3 fatty acids. It has to be converted to those two omega-3 fatty acids. The other means of uh, Obtaining omega-3 is through fish oil and uh, eating fatty fish. That actually came, contains natural EPA and, and DHA, and it, it's available in capsule form and a liquid form. And, and recommended dosages on those are 2,000 to 3,000 milligrams of fish oil by the capsule per day, and, and the one to two teaspoons of fish oil by liquid. Besides the nutritional supplements, you can obtain omega-3 uh, fatty acids through eating uh, cold water fatty fish such as salmon and tuna. And it's usually recommended three times a, a week for proper eye health. Any kind. Flax seed, yes. You can obtain... Mm -hmm. So yes, that's... That's import, uh, one way of obtaining omega-3. Yeah. Go back. Sure. This one? Mm Uh, 
Beach. We'll get to that on a, on a couple more slides coming up. But it's 650 and 350, and we'll get to that. Um, the other thing to mention is with um, fish oil uh, in omega-3 fatty acids, it's also beneficial to help with lowering cholesterol. Um, the other thing it, it does is it should not, the other thing you have to be cautious of is you shouldn't be taking that if you are on blood thinners. You have to be cautious in terms of taking fish oil if you're on a blood thinner, like uh, Plavix or Coumadin. Some patients, can you eat fish? And yes, that's fine. Yeah, you're probably not getting enough that's going to be a problem. Yeah, you really need over 1,200 milligrams of, uh, of omega-3 to really cause any kind of issues with uh, abnormal bleeding if you're on a, a blood thinner. Um, some patients don't like the taste of fish oil. So you, you can actually find products that have uh, lemon extract in it to help with the taste or orange too, so that's one way. Um, That's the one I recommend, yeah. So, question to you guys. So, which is better to take? Is it flaxseed oil or fish oil? And why? <laughs> Correct. And remember that we talked about the flaxseed oil is actually not truly omega-3 fatty acids <laughs> until it's digested and broken down to them. So... Correct, good, thank you. For oh, the, between the two, it, you're better off with the oil. Higher concentration, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> You'll have to take it with a spoon before you take the chew. <laughs> so as we said, there's natural EPA and DHA, the, the three omega fatty acids within the fish oil. And from flaxseed, you're only deriving about 5% of the EPA and DHA that you would normally get from the fish oil. Okay. Mm hmm mm hmm Correct. Correct. You're having additional and you're still within probably range of what you should be having. The next slide will actually show us how much we should be taking. Any other questions before I go? So we talked about the omega-3s, why they're important. You know, sometimes you hear um, pregnant mothers who should be on taking fish oil. Um, it helps with the brain, the retina, as we talked about. Um, how much do we need a day? There's your answer to the question you had earlier. The, the that is what's recommended for eye health. But that's not a minimum or maximum. You can take up to, before you start having nausea and issues like that, you, you can take up to 1,100 milligrams. So that's what's recommended for eye health. Fish oil. Just this whole fish oil. That is the combination of both. So when you look at the label, you're going to see not the EPA. And you'll see it broken down in both ways. So this is just the full omega-3. This is broken down to the two kinds of omega-3 that are within the, the product. Okay? Confusing people. So teaspoons, it's going to be a different formulation. The teaspoons would be about, it's recommended about one to two teaspoons, and I'm uncertain as to how much is in each teaspoon.
usually what I'll tell a patient is two capsules of the fish oil. They're typically about, you know, I'll give you the, the liquid. Yeah, I'm not too familiar then with that. And again, it's really dependent on the company and how much they're putting in there. Yeah. With regards, yeah, you might have to, you might not have to. So it depends on. Correct. Yep. Yep. The only time that it probably could cause nausea and issues, such as if you take over about 1,100 milligrams usually when you can have the overdose of actually no of the, the, the omega-3 fish oil yeah. fish oil that that's the recommended dosage for eye health mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I wouldn't go more than that. I mean, you're end up you're going to end up getting that problem. The other, there's going to be a couple more slides that's going to show you the um, RDA, the recommended daily allowance, and then how much is recommended for eye health. So then you can compare the two. So that's coming down in the slides further. Um, I think. Which one was that? Oh, um, some patients are also vegetarians, so they're pretty much, if they need to get omega-3, they're going to go through the, through the flax sheet. So some patients who have issues taking fish oil, causes indigestion, or they don't like the taste, that, that's where we go. Similar to the, um, the, the fish oil. Any other questions on this before I move to the chapter? So the second condition we're going to talk about is cataracts, which uh, I'm sure you've had relatives or friends who have had a cataract or yourself have had, or had, a, have had a cataract. But it's a cloudy or opaque area in the normally clear lens of the eye. It causes blurred vision, glare, problems typically with night vision, halos around light um, is another symptom that we tend to hear. And it's uh, over 22 million Americans have cataracts. It's a to the next slide and talk about some of the causes, age, and again, just as with dry eyes, the older we live, the, the greater chance we're going to develop a cataract. Um, medications, prednisone is a big one that we tend to see cataracts develop it with. Antipsychotics is another. The amount of UV, UV light radiation, um, welders, we tend to see cataracts accelerate and develop at younger ages in patients with who are welders because of their exposure to the UV light. Also, uh, any type of injury to the eye can cause a disruption to the lens and cause a development of the cataract. Medical conditions, uh, diabetes is a big one. We tend to see cataracts develop more so with patients who are diabetic, and smoking and alcohol use are other factors that can cause cataracts. Sun, the UV light from the sun is, is definitely, you, you'll tend to see patients who live closer to the equator where they have more exposure to the sunlight will develop cataracts at a quicker pace. A little bit. We'll get into the macular degeneration and you'll see that that's actually a, a big thing. The UV light really plays a big role with light colored eyes with macular degeneration. So also, you know, out of all the, the factors here, it's really age. If we live old enough to be, we'll all develop some form of a cataract. So different types. Um, there's the nuclear sclerotic, which is the more common type, and it's involved in the center part of the lens where it clouds over. It's the, the age-related type and with the UV exposure. The reason it clouds over, now the lens is made out of protein fibrils and uh, water. So those fibers are all lined up perfectly together 
And when they're lined up perfectly together, that makes it optically clear so the light can pass through it. But when the UV oxidizes the, the, those protein fibrils, they tend, tend to you know, get irregular in shape. And that's what's what, what ultimately causes the clouding to the lens. The uh, subcapsular type is also an, another type that we tend to see. It's, it involves the back part of the lens. It's uh, steroids, um, prednisone, as we talked about. And you typically have to be on a high dose of steroids for a long period of time before you start, tend to see the cataract. Uh, diabetics also tend to show the subcapsular type. And that's on the back part of the lens. And, it, it, and you'll see rapid progression here. But when we say rapid progression, it's not over days months to a few years, because typically when you first see it, it'll progress to the point where you made surgery at that, that time frame. The nuclear sclerotic, sometimes 10, 15 years before it comes to the point of requiring surgery. And the final type uh, is the cortical type, and that involves the middle layers of the lens, where you can tend to develop a little pacification with these little spokes. And the, the, these are more, more effective to patients uh, nighttime driving because your pupil will dilate, and that's when the light will hit those areas where their opacation is, and they'll scatter that light. So if you're more in a bright situation, your, your pupil's going to constrict, and you're not going to be able to, the light's not going to pass through those areas. So that really doesn't affect the patients when they're doing reading. They're up close to where something like this, where it's centralized in the back, is going to affect your vision more so uh, for reading or up close things rather than nighttime. So cataract prevention, um, not much here. Again, age is the, the, the main determining factor. It's not a typically a genetic uh, condition. If you're able to reduce your UV exposure, wearing sunglasses has UV protection and it's important. Um, Patients, as I said, who are welders, you want to make sure you're protecting your eyes all the time when you're welding. And uh, the healthy diet part we'll talk about in the next slide. So the basic treatment, as we all know, is surgery. It's the, the most common surgery in the United States. Uh, there's over 3 million surgeries done each year. And basically the surgery involves making a small incision around the limbus, which is the, where the white part meets the color part of your eye. And they go in there with it, almost like a, an ultrasonic vacuum. It basically will break down that crystalline clouded lens, suck up all those little pieces, and then they'll insert a, a very thin little foldable implantable lens into that little incision that we make. And that goes in the area that's nice where that cataract was. And you're putting an implant in that's nice and clear now so the light can pass through and you can see clearly. The other thing, it, when they insert that implant, is they try to set the power that you need for that implant so you won't need glasses for distance. So your eyeglass prescription pretty much will get the power within that implant. So you don't need glasses far away and you may just need them just for reading. So it decreases or eliminates your dependency on eyeglass. You know, <coughs> you hear that all the time. Um, there are newer procedures that are not FDA approved yet where laser can be done to do that, but it, it is a surgical procedure. You have to go inside the eyes to remove the, the cataract. When you hear laser, the laser is typically used after you've had the cataract surgery. That implant can develop a film on the back surface, and that's when uh, laser is used. So, no. No. The only time the laser is used is typically about if, if you have this film on the implant, most patients don't. And 40% of the patients who have cataract surgery, they need that film cleared, and that's when laser is used. So it's an actual surgical procedure when you have your cataract removed. But as I said, within the next 5, 10 years, there may be a procedure that's just used solely using laser to, to clear the cataract. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. not, yeah. You know, if you had your wisdom teeth out, not completely put under, you may groggy enough that you're not feeling anything. But yeah, you're giving him to. It's done at a surgery center. Um, you mean the multifold? There, there are multi multifocal implantable uh, lenses. 
and they were FDA approved maybe about 10 years ago, 10, 12 years ago, and you know the success hasn't been that great. So you tend to see a lot of the surgeons not they're shying away more from the multifocals until they're, they've come to the point where they can perfect them a little better. Yeah. So. Implantable lens that will help with color vision. You mean? Yeah. Not that I saw. It's, it's a red lens typically that helps with color blindness. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, to tell you the truth, it hasn't been really effective. Those red lenses to help with with color blindness. But uh, I haven't heard of anything where they've tried to do it as an implant inside. So if a patient has glaucoma and needs to have cataract surgery, typically no. And actually, to tell you the truth, you, you can actually lower your pressure of your eye by having cataract surgery a couple of points. So it, it's advantageous sometimes to have cataract surgery when you do have glaucoma. No? So, you know, there's not much focus on what to eat, what nutritional supplements to take for cataracts because there's a surgical procedure that's done for it. So, you know, some of the things you can take are vitamin E, vitamin C, and along with the lutein and zeaxanthin. So, uh, those are going to be more described when we get into the macular degeneration because they're beneficial for that. And sources of the vitamin E, sunflower seed, almond, and spinach. And we all know where you can get your vitamin C from. Lutein and zeaxanthine, spinach, kale, uh, dark, dark creams, uh, those kinds of products are pretty high in lutein and zeaxanthine. Uh, so really not much you can do to try to slow progression of cataracts other than really, you know, protecting your eyes from the sun rather than taking nutritional supplements. In terms for the lens, they can, they can actually prevent those, remember we were talking about the fibrils, prevent it. But it doesn't, it can slow the progression, but not prevent it. So the final uh, condition, uh, disease we'll talk about is the macular degeneration, where we're probably going to get the bulk of our information of what we can do to hopefully preserve our vision for the rest of our life. Um, Macular degeneration is an eye disease affecting the macula. And we talked about the macula being the most sensitive part of your retina. It's um, the center of the, the light sensitive retina at the back of the eye. And uh, what the macular degeneration will do is it will cause loss or distortion of your central vision. Your peripheral vision will always stay intact. You don't go completely blind from macular degeneration. But um, it'll affect your central vision. So it's going to affect you most when you're doing reading or things up close. So normal condition, you're going to see everything clearly. Early macular degeneration, you may not see it too well, but you'll get more of a central distortion to your vision. Things that look straight may look bent or curved, and then some of the late macular degenerations uh, will cause loss of your central vision. You'll see AMD as the uh, abbreviation for macular degeneration. The A stands for age-related. I typically don't like to say that. So I just say macular degeneration. I want to stay as young as possible. Um, approximately 15 million, we talked about cataracts. Cataracts were 22 million, but approximately 15 million Americans have some form of macular degeneration. We're seeing significant increases with it uh, in the span of uh, 13 years. We've, there's been about a 25% increase. And it's the largest increase among all the major eye diseases. There are components that are hereditary. About 50% of macular degeneration cases are hereditary. It's the leading cause of blindness in Americans that are over 65. Um, going back to the other two conditions, we typically start to see dry eye mid-50s. Um, 
cataracts in the mid-70s, and then the macular regeneration typically around 65, mid-60s. Mm -hmm. She may have had something else with the cornea involved. Sometimes you can develop swelling to the cornea, and um, you know they're probably trying to give her what sight she can possibly get by doing a corneal transplant. Yeah, but there's there's not a procedure that's done for corneal uh, for macular degeneration, but it involves the cornea. No operation. <coughs> mm -hmm. There are some treatments available um, injections, but that's for uh, the more advanced cases of macular degeneration. So early stages of macular degeneration is more preserving your vision by diet and using nutritional supplements. The, the injections can reverse and improve the vision a little bit, but never to the point of having getting your vision back to normal. In terms of macular holes, it totally it's in the same area where macular degeneration is, but with macular holes, there's, again, nothing preventatively that you can do for that. It's, it's really an anatomical defect that occurs to the macula where it just stretches and it causes a hole. But uh, in terms of taking anything or using anything, unfortunately, no. Um, the chances of developing any other eye are pretty slim. Pretty slim. It depends on how severe, you know, the macular hole you have in the right and in the, in the yeah, you, that's what you see. This one? This one? Mm-hmm. No. I see a little imbalance of your eyes. Do you have a lazy eye? That's probably the reason why you're seeing things like that. So it, it's not probably macular degeneration. So types of macular degeneration. There's the dry form and the wet form. You may have heard. Uh, the more common type is the dry form. And about 85% to 90% um, patients uh, have the dry form. It's depicted by these little yellow deposits that develop in the macula. And um, they'll cause, as we said, more of a distortion. The dry type typically will cause more of a distortion to your central vision rather than the loss that we s showed on the left side where the advanced macular degeneration is. That's a slow progressive disorder. So it's going to take years before it may progress where it may start to cause some loss of vision. That picture up there probably would not affect the patient visually. It, you would think it would, but it probably does not affect their vision. The second type is, oh, back to the dry. There's no appro approved cure or treatment for it. We talked about that. And that's why the importance of uh, vitamins, taking multivitamins to help prevent that from getting worse and also prevent it from developing into the wet type. So we'll get into the what you should be using and taking for that. Uh, the wet type is the less common type. About 10 to 15 percent of all macular degeneration cases are of the wet form. And it develops because blood, there, there's abnormal vessels that develop behind your, your macula or behind the retina. And then it'll start to leak blood. And when it starts to leak blood, it'll develop right in the center and it'll cause all this swelling and fluid to develop there, and that's going to ultimately cause loss of your central vision. It accounts, as we said, for 90% of severe vision loss. So that picture where we showed the one in the where there's loss of central vision, 
that's what a patient who has wet macular degeneration would treat them. We talked about treatments. Um, treatments involve taking injections of what's called anti-VEGF. Um, those are administered typically every three, uh, four months, depending on what type of uh, anti-VEGF is used. If you, you need the injections every four months or every eight months. Um, I'm sorry, four weeks or every eight weeks. Um, and that tends to delay the progression of that. It'll start to clear up all that fluid, all that blood that's developed in there, and it may actually improve the vision, typically a line or two, but it'll never get back to the point of where your vision was before you developed that. And we talked about the, the, the dry eye, the, the, the dry macular degeneration can develop into the wet type, and about 10 to 15 of those dry cases develop into the wet form. So that's going to be the importance of where the vitamins are going to play a role and how you can, uh, lifestyle changes you can, you can make to help prevent that from developing. The risk factors, age, as we said, um, mid-70s or mid-60s is usually when this can develop. It's more common in Caucasians. We talked about earlier that the lighter colored skin, the lighter colored irises will allow more of the UV light to penetrate the eye, get to the macula and cause those changes. The genetic factor, it is hereditary, about 50% of macular degeneration is a hereditary condition. Smoking is a big one. Um, some re research reports show up to 20 times increased chance of developing macular degeneration if, if smoking. Obesity, lack of um, exercise, and then uh, the two visible, the visible blue light and the ultraviolet light from the sun exposure to that is also a determining factor of developing macular degeneration. Visible blue light is on the lower spectrum of the light. It's actually light that helps constrict the pupil. So it's something that comes from the sun and it's actually part of the spectrum of blue. When you see something blue, it's that blue light that, pr that allows you to see that blue. But um, it also helps with um, sleep cycles too, so it helps with the circadian rhythm. So there is some good points to what visible blue light does, but it, it, does, it can be harmful to the eyes in terms of developing macular degeneration. There's a slide at the end that we can go into more detail of that. That will not, this that won't affect cataracts. The, the UV is the only thing that will really affect the cataract. This goes through the lens, gets to the macula, and that's where it can affect it. So what happened was um, the National Eye Institute back in 2001 did a study of how supplements can be beneficial to see if any kind of supplements can be beneficial to help with macular degeneration and prevent it from progressing. So they took uh, over 3,500 3, patients who had high risks for developing macular degeneration and gave them over seven years nutritional supplements that are listed there, beta carotene, which is vitamin A, vitamin C, the vitamin E, zinc, and copper. And they gave it in those dosages. So after seven years, they were able to conclude that um, macular degeneration can respond to nutritional supplements and slow its progression. And they, they, they found that about 25%, there's a 25% decrease of risk for developing macular degeneration by taking those specific uh, vitamins and minerals. And sure. Now you won't want to copy these down because there's a another study that was done in 2013 that changed the, the way of what you should be taking. Okay? So there'll be a slide that I'll tell you which one to copy down. You have a hard time. They're so big. I would go that route. You can actually do it that route or you can actually take each individual one rather than take them all in one. You can take... But if that's the only source of way of getting it, 
then I would do it that way. But the other way of actually getting all those vitamins is to take each one individually rather than taking them all as, as in one multivitamin. None of these that are listed. It was the omega-3 fish oil. Correct. Correct. But again, don't use this as the basis of what you should be taking because when you get to ARH2, you'll see that they added the fish oil into this. Okay. So this was the uh, first study that was done. And then they were finding that the, the beta carotene was causing some issues where it increases your risk for um, lung cancer in patients who smoke, or former smokers. Eating carrots, you can get, you can't, if you're a smoker, you can. that's how you can get your beta carotene. Is it better to take it that way? Oh yeah, anytime you can, Take your, take it by diet, by eating. You rather want to do it that way than take a nutritional supplement. Orange juice. Uh huh. Really? <laughs> yeah, I've seen, I've seen uh, probably on YouTube patients have turned you know orange yellow just from taking too much of that. So the conclusions we went over in terms of what the ARIG, initial ARIG uh, study did back in 2001. So then we were talking about the follow-up study, which is the ARIG-2, which was completed in 2013. They took over 4,000 patients who, again, had high risk for macular degeneration. And over a span of five years, gave them the original ARIG formula, except they removed the vitamin A, the beta carotene, and they lowered the amount of zinc. They continued with the vitamin C and the E, but they added the omega-3 fatty acids in those percentages for the, the DHA and the uh, EPA. And then they also added the carotene, uh, the lutein and the zeaxanthin. When they initially did it, they did an equal balance of the lutein and zeaxanthin and they didn't see that there was any benefic beneficial improvements in terms of preventing the macular degeneration by, have, say, using two milligrams and two milligrams of each. When they did it in a five to one ratio, they actually saw the benefit. Is that, Is that what you should be taking? No, no. Keep holding off, I'll tell you when. <laughs> So the conclusions of the second study show that the addition of the omega-3 fatty acids, oh, I just wrote it wrong. It was supposed to, by itself did not lower the, oh, that's right. The omega-3 fatty acids did not by itself lower the risk of macular degeneration. The removal of the beta carotene had no effect on the progression rate. So by removing the beta carotene, it di you didn't develop the macular degeneration at a greater rate. So they felt that you know the beta carotene, because of the high risk of lung cancer, they decided to eliminate that and take that out. And then they, they found that by adding the lutein, the zeaxanthin, that that actually lowered the risk of uh, macular degeneration an extra 20% on top of the original 25%. So, there's actually, this would be the slide to come. This is the one. So that's what's recommended from the, the actual study, the ARIDS-2 study. You can find multivitamins that have that same distribution of vitamin C, vitamin E, the zinc and the copper, along with the, the lutein and the zeaxanthin.
Lutein is an a antioxidant. It helps prevent those, those cells of the macula from degrading and, and changing shape. A little bit, but more in dark greens. Actually, the, the greens, the spinach, you're better off not cooking it. You get more of the benefit of the mineral. Yeah. If you uncooked, uncooked, yeah. International unit. You guys have good questions because they're all the next. <laughs> So how much do you need? The RDA, the recommended daily allowance for vitamin C is 75 to 90. For eye health, as we said, 500 milligrams per day. And those are some of the sources where you can get your vitamin C. And you really can't overdose on vitamin C. It can cause nausea and diarrhea, but um, no issues with taking the 500 milligrams. This one? Too far back? You'll see that on the listing for the, the listing. I put the major ones on here. Yeah. And then the vitamin E. How much do you need in a day? The recommended daily allowance is 22. International units per day. And with regards to eye health, 400 is what's recommended there. And some of the sources where you can get that. talked about some of the risks involved with the omega-3s, but also with the vitamin E, there's a risk for abnormal bleeding with patients who are on blood thinners. You know, the low-dose aspirin is probably not a concern. So always check with your doctor before if you want to take a vitamin E or omega-3 if you're on any blood thinner. So what does the lutein do? Um, it acts as a natural blue, fil blue light fil filter. As we talked about, the high energy light, the blue light, can uh, cause changes to the macula, which ultimately leads to the macular degeneration. So it helps reduce the exposure to those high energy blue lights. And then, as we said, it's an antioxidant. It neutralizes or quenches those, those free radicals that causes the, the macular degeneration. Blue light comes from the sun. That's one way. And now with all these, you know, iPhones and you know, screens, um, even the CFL bulbs and the uh, LED bulbs, high percentage of blue light comes from those. So, you know, there's more research that is being done on blue light and see how damaging it is. So how much lutein zeaxanthine? We talked about the five to one ratio is the most beneficial for eye health, 10 milligrams per day versus the two, and two milligrams for the zeaxanthine. And most, this is where you're probably going to find yourself needing to use nu nutritional supplements because most patients don't get most of it from their diet. Um, the regular dietary guidelines are about four to eight milligrams of lutein and zeaxanthine, but only less than four percent actually meet that guideline. U.S. average is 1 to 2.5, so you really need to boost that up, about 10. Oh. And ways you can naturally get your zeaxanthine is uh, the kale, the spinach. You can see, look at the percentage. 
how much more you can get from those two. And then there's the broccoli we talked about. Correct. Yeah. I love spinach. Kale, I, I don't care for. It. Bitter. Yeah. So it's really finding a balance of diet and where you need to supplement. And then zinc is a mineral and how much you need. Red meat, poultry, mixed nuts is where you can get that in your diet. And the only reason the copper, the copper actually doesn't do anything for the macular or the retina. It was only added in there because the high doses of, of zinc actually causes a copper deficiency, so you need to supplement that. Same, it's, I accidentally put, it's the RDA, it should be the RDA. Oh, you need that page? So the last screen is going to be the, really the take-home message. It's going to summarize all of them. So you can see a lot of products will have that formulation for eye health for macular degeneration. So it's the 500 milligrams of the vitamin C, the 400 vitamin E, the zinc, and the copper, and that amount. You can actually get one vitamin that has it specifically like that. You'll see on the labels of the multivitamins, it'll say ARIDS2 for formula. Okay, so then that's how you can actually get it all in one vitamin. And it's, it's typically most of them are taking two tablets a day. They're large, is it? Yeah, the woman, as the woman was stating, it's just sometimes hard to get down. And then the final things in, in lifestyle changes. Oh, sure. Correct. You'll see those exact amounts. Doesn't help with anything. Doesn't help you improve your vision. Doesn't nothing at all. Only if you have like eye muscle imbalance issues. There, there is what's called vision training that can be helpful if you have like an eye turn or an issue like that. Still need that page, anybody? Got it? All right, so on to, um, we've talked about what supplements you should be taking, what you could e be eating in your diet that is helpful to pr protect your eyes and preserve your vision. But the final thing I wanted to talk about, and um, also Stacey, our opticians out there, she has some demonstrations of some of the, the, the filters and the, the coatings that can be placed on glasses that can protect your eyes. But um, we had talked about the UV light, but I wanted to get a little more detail of that. Um, the UV light is on, the, again, the shorter spectrum of, of light. It's close to that blue light, the high energy blue light we were talking about. This is not visible to your eye. UV light is not visible to your eye, but the blue light is. Um, there's three wavelength zones for it, the UVA, UVB, and the UVC. You'll tend to see on sunglasses, you'll see 100% protection with, from UVA and UVB. The reason you don't see the UVC is because that's filtered out through the ozone. So UVC never makes it to us. So you really, those UVA and UVB are the ones that can cause the acceleration of the cataract. High level exposure is the most damaging, and we talked about welders. Those are the ones you can tend to see patients who can develop cataracts at a quicker, at a younger age. People that go to tanning beds, the UV light, well, now they spray tan, but, um, but the UV light from the, the tanning beds, too. Well, they, 
eyes, eyes closed, you're protecting your eyes, but they still give you the shield you should be putting on. So the UV light can also cause issues with the cornea. So everything's in the front part of the eye. It can cause corneal burns, uh, the cataracts, as we talked about, and also what is called inguiculas and pterygiums, the little bumps that develops on the whites of your eyes around 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock, right at the edge of where your color part meets the white part of your eye. And to see those typically with patients who are from countries that by the equator. And those can start to grow on the cornea and they can sometimes cause issues with uh, vision and they can be removed. So the main protection, you want to get a good pair of ophthalmic quality sunglasses that has the UVA and the UVB filtering for protection. That will help both with cataracts and less so with regards to macular degeneration. Meaning that it actually has the filtering in it. If you go to like the dollar store, and I'm, my understanding now I've heard is all the even all sunglasses have to have the 100% UVA and UVB. But if if it's over 10, 15, you know, over fifteen dollars, you're typically going to get the ophthalmic quality. Typically from an optical shop rather than from a retail store. And then the thing that we haven't heard much about, we always hear about UV light and how damaging it is to your skin hopefully learn something about how damaging it can be to your eyes. But uh, you never hear much about this high energy blue light. And as we said, it's a visible light. It's on the lower spectrum. It helps with regulating the sleep cycles um, and also helps constrict your pupil. So it has some functions that are important to your eyes. But um, as we said, it's found in just natural sunlight in all the iPhones, iPads, even all this new modern lighting, uh, the CFL bulbs and the LED bulbs. And it will cause the damage to the back part of the eye. It doesn't affect the lens, it will affect the macula. So they have um, now coatings that can be placed on lenses that can protect your eyes from the blue light. And that's um, where Stacy can, can show you some of those samples out front. I don't know where exactly she is by the cash register. So she has products out there that she can show you. It, it's, you know, it hasn't been fully investigated. There's still some, you know, gray areas in terms of if it actually does cause it. There's some research that, that shows that it may, but there's nothing definitive as of yet. It's still just started. It's, it's so new that it's just starting to be investigated that it's possibly a potential issue. But my recommendation is you, you should have it to protect your eyes, especially with now all these devices that have emitting of the blue light. It's important. Not as of yet that I've seen, but eventually, you know, just like when you used to have the screens that you used to put on the, on the well, with the advent of the new screens, you really don't need that anymore. Eventually, I think I think I've heard of one computer manufacturer is actually considering putting in the, the blockage the blue light in, the, in their screen. Mm -hmm. And think about how much light time they have. Correct. So again, not fully on, not 100% showing that it causes macular degeneration or accelerates it, but there is some minor um, research that shows that it can. I, I, you know, again, as I said, it's not, not sure 100 percent, but it, it, it would be recommended, knowing the fact that there, there's some literature out there that indicates that it can cause damage to your macula. No. No. <laughs> so, thank you. I, 